Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Zakia, for the kind uh, introduction and for the, for the invitation. I will use this screen for pointing uh, for half of the talk, and then I'll switch to the other one in fairness to everybody. So um, we'll talk about using organic electronics to interface uh, with the brain, and I will justify why one wants to do that. Um, interfacing with the brain is extremely important. Uh, the brain is a very complicated machinery. Uh, the human brain consists of about 85 billion neurons that are organized in networks and in networks of networks. And it's the communication of these networks that holds the key for understanding how our brain works, which is probably the most fundamental challenge uh, facing humankind. It's important to study the brain not only for the challenge of it, but to be able to help people with pathologies that require those networks, such as epilepsy, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, brain tumors, and so on and so forth. And increasingly, the use of electrical stimulation is being used as a therapy. Um, so if you take a reductionist approach, and not every neuroscientist is uh, in agreement with this, uh, all the power of the brain, all our consciousness, all our uh, thoughts, our dreams, arise from the action of neurons that uh, consist of a body that has dendrites that collect information from nearby uh, neurons, compile this information, and then send a signal uh, called the action potential through a wire which is called the axon, and then either uh, excite or inhibit activity in the postsynaptic neuron. So if you put an electrode in the neighborhood of, uh, uh, of the neuron, you can listen into the signal. And in the clinic, this is taking place in three configurations. Uh, the first one is, co is called electroencephalography, and it, it involves using uh, cutaneous scalp electrodes um, that uh, are minimally invasive and can record information from a brain area underlying the electrode. This gives you rather average information with a spatial resolution of about a centimeter. On the other extreme, you have stereotaxic electroencephalography or depth probing, where you introduce electrodes into the brain, you penetrate the brain with electrodes. This is obviously invasive, but here you can get spatial resolutions of the order of a single neuron using small electrodes of the size of a single neuron, of the order of 10 microns. Somewhere in between, in terms of, uh, in this trade-off between invasiveness and spatial resolution, lies electrocorticography. I will talk extensively about this technique today. Here you do a craniotomy you expose the surface of the brain, and then you land an array of electrodes on the surface of the brain without penetrating. Um, so of course, every technique has its uh, advantages and disadvantages, and we'll talk about those in a, uh, in a minute. Um, we work closely with a group that um, studies uh, epilepsy and is trying to help people with, uh, uh, with uh, grave forms of the disease. Epilepsy is a condition that affects a large uh, amount of the uh, world population, and in certain cases, it can be uh, disabling and pharmacoresistant. It uh, uh, refuses to get better with uh, uh, medical treatment, with uh, drug treatment. So in these cases, the patient will come in, will be implanted with electrodes and stay implanted for a period of uh, two weeks under observation um, through video for uh, uh, looking at clinical symptoms of a seizure, and at the same time, electrophysiological observation. So the, the electrical uh, signals recorded deep in the brain with these electrodes are monitored uh, continuously in order to confirm um, the, uh, the seizure electrically and in order to localize at which area of the brain uh, the seizure begins. It's called the epileptogenic zone and then the surgeon will go in and try to remove it. So the challenges here are to improve the electrode performance, to get electrodes that can record with a higher signal-to-noise ratio so you can pick up the origin of the seizure as early as possible. Um, the ability to make less invasive recordings, for example, if you could localize epileptogenic zones deep in the brain from the surface without penetrating the brain, that would be a great thing. And the abilities then to uh, provide therapy 
using methods that are alternative to surgical removal of a part of the brain, for example, by localized drug delivery. Um, this is one example of uh, uh, implantable devices. There are many other implantable electronic devices that are used to deliver therapy that have been approved by the uh, FDA with uh, pacemakers leading the way. It's pretty much the most common bioelectronic device implanted today. Uh, over 600,000 implantations per year. Then you have cochlear implants for hearing, um, uh, stimulators for uh, relieving the tremor of Parkinson's disease uh, or for pain uh, relief and so on and so forth, and then many more in development. So this is a field that's about to explode in terms of application. So here comes uh, organics. What do organics bring to the table? Now, right at the interface where uh, the electronic material meets the biological environment, uh, the challenge is to interface ionic carriers which are in an aqueous environment uh, with electronic carriers in the electronic material. If you try to do that with silicon, then the coupling between um, these two carriers is mediated by the uh, dielectric. Uh, and uh, even in the case where the dielectric is reduced to zero thickness, it attains a maximum value that corresponds to what is called the double layer capacitor. So you form a parallel plate capacitor. Um, and that's the maximum coupling you can have. Any further interaction is screened by that layer of charge uh, at the interface of the uh, semiconductor. Now, in organic uh, materials, you can have ion permeation through the bulk of the film. There are lots of mixed conductors in organics that can uh, exchange ions with solution, giving rise to bulk three-dimensional coupling. And uh, as I will show you, this can lead to novel or uh, state-of-the-art or devices with state-of-the-art performance. So I'll show you three examples of devices um, where we use organic electronics to, uh, get, uh, uh, to get novel performance or uh, to make a novel device or get state-of-the-art performance and uh, uh, understand some things in neuroscience, deliver a unique, a new tool to neuroscience research. The first example is using uh, microelectrodes uh, to record single neurons from the surface of the brain, something that was not thought uh, uh, possible up to about a year ago. So uh, conducting polymers have been used uh, for a couple of years now uh, to improve neural interfaces. This is an example from uh, the work of Dave Martin. There was work uh, by uh, Gordon Wallace in Australia and Uli Inganas in, uh, in Europe, um, where they take a, a, a deep probe, a depth probe that is implanted uh, deep in the brain. Uh, it has metal recording electrodes, and then they electrochemically polymerize the conducting polymer film. And by and large, the community found that if you do that, um, not only you record better these uh, spikes that are signatures of uh, neural activity, but also the electrode can keep recording after a long-term implantation, while the, uh, the metal electrode will foul and uh, will uh, quit recording. So by and large, the mechanisms underlying uh, those phenomena are not understood. If you ask the people why the performance is better, they will point to the fact that when you put a conducting layer uh, coating on an electrode, you lower the electrochemical impedance at the interface with the electrolyte. And um, then if you ask them why does that happen, they'll wave their arms and say maybe there is some ion penetration into the organic film. And that gives you a different nature of the capacitance across that interface. It gives you a higher capacitance or a lower impedance. I'll talk about the details of this process in a, uh, in a moment. But uh, the, the, the point to keep in mind is that uh, using a conducting uh, polymer coating lowers your impedance and leads to better recordings. Um, now, we got involved in this field around 2010. And at that time, this was the state of the art in electrocorticography by uh, John Rogers' group at uh, Illinois. He made very flexible, uh, very conformable arrays of electrodes so that they could uh, uh, conform well to the carvilinear um, shape of the brain. And being able to make good mechanical contact with the brain is important. Um, and in this case, they could record from this electrode brain activity that was 
average over about um, of the scale of a millimeter underlying uh, the electrode. So they were probing a volume of millimeter cube uh, uh, underlying the electrode with many neurons. Um, we used a different approach. We used uh, 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 electrode arrays made out of uh, parallel, which is a film known to microfabrication. It's used as an encapsulation in medical devices. Um, and we made electrodes in that film uh, that uh, consist of a conducting uh, polymer layer. These were made uh, using photolithography so we could access small uh, dimensions of the order of uh, a neuron. And when we tested those, those were highly conformal as you would expect. The films were, uh, were about four microns thick. And because of the conducting polymer coating, we could access information um, that was not uh, accessible before. So all things being equal, if you try to do this with gold electrodes, you fail in this rat model to pick up activity in the 30 hertz uh, uh, region, which corresponds to a, a seizure phenomenon, while the P-dot electrode can, can capture those accurately. So this was expected due to the lower impedance. What was not expected, and this was work that was done in uh, Bujaki's lab by uh, Dionko Dagoli, was that when you scale these electrodes even further, um, then you can get single uh, neuron activity recorded from under the cortex. Um, that uh, allows a non-invasive way to uh, park yourself close to, um, uh, away from the neuron, uh, do not penetrate the brain, and still be able to record uh, individual activity. Um, this was also done in a clinical setting uh, on, a, on a two patients suffering from uh, epilepsy where these conducting polymer electrodes uh, can record not only the macroscopic brain activity of an ensemble of neurons uh, in the brain but also individual spikes giving for the first time uh, the opportunity to look at single neuron um, effects that uh, underlie uh, epilepsy, again, without penetrating the brain. Now, you can get a bit uh, more fancy uh, by using transistors uh, to get even higher signal uh, fidelity. Um, when we talk about transistors in bioelectronics, we have to cite the work of uh, Peter Fromherz, who pioneered the use of silicon devices in recording neural activity, in this case, in culture. So um, he uses a silicon channel with uh, an oxide or a nitride as a gate insulator um, to and then interfaces in a liquid environment in culture media with cells in this configuration you have a layer of ions that uh, coats the surface of your gate dielectric and induces electronic charge in the uh, in the channel so you have an effective gate potential that controls your uh, drain current. And when the neuron is uh, uh, producing action potential, this effective gate potential is modified and that changes your drain current. Now, again, this is the case of a parallel plate capacitor. And the thicker the dielectric, the less efficient this coupling. If you reduce the thickness of the dielectric down to zero, you would have the maximum possible coupling in this configuration, which is characterized by a capacitance per unit area of the order of five microfarads per uh, square centimeter. A way to go beyond that limit is to use a transistor which is called the organic electrochemical transistor that was invented in the 80s by Mark Wrighton's group at that time at MIT. This is the halfway point, so I'm gonna, so it's actually a bit past the halfway point. I apologize to the right side of the audience. So here, um, you have no dielectric uh, at the interface with uh, 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 the electrolyte and ions are free to go in and out of the channel and change the doping state of the polymer throughout its volume. Uh, in this case, if you measure the capacitance of the channel as a function of its dimensions, you will find that it's proportional to the volume rather than the area of the channel. Uh, and this is uh, interesting. In field effect transistors, I remind you that the scaling goes with area. Here you go with volume, which indicates that ions really penetrate throughout the volume of the film. And you take advantage of the whole volume. So you get the capacitance with scales with volume, so a volumetric capacitance, 
And if you do a quick calculation, if you have a film of 130 nanometers, you end, you end up having an equivalent capacitance per unit area that is two orders of magnitude larger than the limit that you could get with a parallel plate uh, uh, capacitor in an electrolyte. So you can use that phenomenon to design transistors that work exceptionally well. The physics is fairly simple. It relies on compensation doping. Under the action of a gate, you can have ions that go um, in and out of the, uh, of the channel and change its doping state. Um, in this case, we use a P-type uh, semiconductor, so a conducting polymer that is degenerately doped to have holes. If we uh, introduce positive ions in, then the holes go away, the material is de-doped. If we introduce negative ions in the channel, the material gets doped even further. So that's how we modulate conductivity. Um, in the lab, we do this by playing with the gate potential. On the brain, we let the, the brain, the neurons in the brain supply the potential that drive the ions in and out of the channel. Um, so these are the electrical characteristics of the transistor. The output curves look like the output curves of any transistor. Notice the low operating voltage, which is consistent with operation in liquids. And then this is the most important curve, which is the transfer curve that tells you how much a potential applied at the channel changes the drain current, which is what you measure. You want this curve to be as steep as possible to have high sensitivity. The slope of the curve is called the transconductance, and it's shown here in green. Um, to have a maximum at zero, gate vol uh, zero volts, gate voltage, this was not by accident. The device was engineered to be this way. What is important is the transconductance is the, in the millisiemens uh, regime. And this is attributed to the three-dimensional uh, doping of the channel. You have transconductances that are the highest than any other transistor out there. And of course, this is because in all the other transistors, they operate through the field effect. So you have a, a, a surface accumulation of charge, while here we take advantage of the whole volume of the channel. Now, we prepared electrocorticography arrays uh, having electrodes and transistors. And indeed, you can verify that the transistor provides considerably higher signal to noise ratio, more than 20 decibel. Uh, when recording the same uh, seizure phenomena in a, in a rat model. Not only you can record information with a higher signal to noise ratio, that means you can record, you can collect the same amount of meaningful data in a much shorter time, but you can also look deeper in the brain. So in this case, we use uh, a transistor and an electrode at the surface of the brain, and then another electrode which penetrates the brain. And we're looking at activity which takes place from uh, uh, deeper in the brain. Now, the depth electrode can measure this activity uh, very well. These are the frequency components. This is called time frequency analysis, and it represents the frequency components that uh, are found in this signal. And this is what is used to identify this particular activity. You see that you cannot get uh, a good resolution if you do uh, the same thing with a surface electrode, but you can get good resolution with a transistor due to the higher signal to noise ratio. Now, um, the transconductance, if you do a little bit of uh, device modeling, you find that it depends on thickness, which is the particularity of the, uh, the transistor. Here is shown scaling with thickness. Again, this doesn't happen in a field effect transistor. So you can reach any transconductance you want if you made your channel thickness. Uh, thicker. This doesn't come for free. You pay a price. Is that the device gets slower. You're charging a large capacitor, and it takes time to charge that. So the uh, response time or the maximum frequency uh, that you can operate the transistor at also depends on the volume of the channel. Uh, but this gives you a new degree of freedom. You can now uh, design transistors that have the same footprint on the channel, on the, on the sample, on, the, uh, on your array, they have the same width and length, but they have different thickness, and you can use thickness as a degree of freedom to tune performance. So here are two transistors, one with a thick and one with a thin channel, recording the same activity. The one with a thick channel has a higher transconductance, so it gives you higher gain, um, but a lower uh, maximum frequency at which you can operate. 
and the opposite for the thin transistor. So in this case, you're interested in activity that is below 10 hertz. You don't need the extra bandwidth. You can trade bandwidth for amplification, for gain, and you can record uh, with exceptionally high fidelity uh, these uh, brain rhythms and also the activity that precedes them uh, in terms of frequency, which is associated with brain uh, trauma. Now, in the previous equation, you see that the materials figure of merit here is the product of uh, whole mobility multiplied by the volumetric capacitance of the channel. And we started looking into uh, uh, materials, uh, different materials, and how they stack up um, uh, with uh, respect to this figure of merit. Um, whole mobility increases with crystallinity. Uh, volumetric capacitance goes the other way, requires a, a, a fluffy material, so there are trade-offs to be uh, made. Um, P dot PSS is the champion material, uh, has the highest product of uh, mu times C star. Another material that we looked at is, uh, is this one. Uh, this is a semiconductor um, that is uh, pristine. It's not electronically doped in contrast with uh, P dot PSS. It has a slightly lower mu C product because uh, the, uh, its uh, whole mobility is uh, low. Um, having said that, uh, we, we've worked for many years on P dot PSS. It's a material that has been optimized to give you the highest mu star uh, we can get in our lab. But there are pleasant surprises. Uh, Ian McCulloch recently gave us a material which does better than P dot PSS, and this is uh, the first time we see this having screened many, many different materials. So uh, you can do better uh, with uh, materials design. Now, the last uh, less than five minutes, yeah, two minutes, I'll talk about some recent work that was done in collaboration with uh, Magnus Bergen's group, who invented a device which is called the organic electronic ion pump that allows you to electrophoretically transfer an ion from one reservoir to the other. This is not a microfluidic where you pump solution that contains some drug molecules. Here you have a reservoir and you only pick up the drug molecule and you uh, move it through a, 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 an ionic conductor and you deliver it to the target reservoir without any solvent. So um, this is a device that they used in uh, um, in, uh, in vitro and also in vivo to modulate hearing in a, in a rat model. Um, the way the device works, I'm not going to spend too uh, much time on this, is um, you have two reservoirs. You have a film of P dot PSS bridging the two, and then you go in the area between the two reservoirs and you kill the electronic conductivity. So now this area can only conduct ions and not uh, electrons or, or holes. So if you apply a potential, um, you can transport holes through the uh, external part of the circuit. And to close the loop, you have to transport ions from one reservoir to the other. This is the mechanism. I'm not going to belabor it. If you have questions, please ask me. So this is the physical implementation of the device. Uh, again, you have the target reservoir we loaded with a drug, in this case, GABA. And then when we switch the device on after uh, a few seconds, we start pumping. We have a current that's an ionic current that delivers, in this case, drug to a, uh, uh, to a tissue slice. Um, so we uh, induced seizures in this tissue slice model. We are sourcing the drug here, and then we're measuring brain activity near the device where the drug is being sourced and away from it. And when we start pumping, then we can stop the seizure near the device, and we do not stop it away from the device. This indicates that the delivery is indeed local. We don't flood the system with drug, but we can control, we can have spatiotemporal control of the drug delivery. This is a rather new result. It was published just a couple of, uh, about four months ago, and it has received a very good welcome by the community. Lots of neuroscientists are interested in this, as it gives you a possibility now to make devices that can deliver small amount of drugs beyond the blood-brain barrier, which is a barrier that eliminates about 98% of the, uh, the drugs out there. So with that, um, 
mixed conductivity of organics is a major asset for applications in bioelectronics. Uh, microelectrodes can allow you to record single neuron activity for the first time non-invasively. Uh, transistors can go beyond that by letting you look deeper, even deeper in the brain. And ion pumps can help you source uh, directly where needed, uh, offering the ability to go past the blood-brain barrier. I'd like to thank the group, Zakia, for the kind invitation. I will single out uh, uh, Jonathan Rivne and Shaika Inal, who led the transistor and the uh, ion pump work, uh, collaborators, funding agencies, and you for your attention.